let me introduce Barry. So most of you guys are familiar with Barry and his work, um, but he's an Atlanta-based artist, uh, and that's really the quickest way to kind of put it. As a small child, his parents plopped him in front of vivid colors and shapes of Jim Henson's universe projected in pixels on TV. He didn't sit solo in front of the family TV for long in his small North Carolina hometown. Uh, he bent over a small stack of computer paper, practicing the images he saw on screen. He eventually made his way west in Atlanta, and over time, he's really developed a unique style combining splashy colors of early 90s childhood with soft contours and watercolor washes. So he's done, he's done work for Ted, that other speaker thing. Uh, <laughs> And then also MailChimp and Atlanta Magazine and many more. So Barry Lee is a great person, and I'm so excited that he's here to share with us today. So let's give him a warm round of applause. Thank you. Are y'all able to hear me? Yeah. Are we good on that? Good. Um, so... I moved to Atlanta when I was 17 years old, and um, on the car ride on the way to Atlanta, I had told myself that I needed to do something to change my life and, and to really survive. I was born in the Outer Banks of North Carolina, specifically Nagtad, and it's a small beach town about 10 hours away from Atlanta. When I was born, um, doctors told my parents I had a very rare syndrome called Nayer's syndrome. And if you look it up on the internet, you can only find about 100 cases reported medically. And it was actually recently only founded in about 1950. So it's still like fairly new and unknown. And this syndrome left me deaf and with eight fingers. By age one, I had nine surgeries. And by 21, I had 20 surgeries. But my parents took things in stride, and they really did have a good sense of humor about things. Um, for example, one time when I was an infant, my dad would have to take me to the hospital about every couple of weeks. And at one point, I had casts on my arms, casts on my legs, a feeding tube, a breathing tube, and a scar across my head. And these two women came up to my dad, and they were kind of pitying me and were like, oh, you know, what happened to the poor baby? And my dad just looked at them straight in the eye and he said, never let your child on a riding lawnmower and he walked away. <laughs> I'm glad, I'm glad you guys have that sense of humor too because I was like, oh God, if this doesn't go well, I'm gonna be like dead on stage like the zombies. Um, so I was continuing all these surgeries and all of that. And by age three, I got a really great Christmas gift. And that was that easel right there. And that kind of like changed my life. And I became obsessed with drawing from that point forward. And throughout preschool and elementary school and middle school, I was just drawing and drawing and drawing. But around that time is when I felt different. And it wasn't because I was born different. It was because other kids were telling me I was different. And I think that's a big difference. And kids would say, well, why do you have four fingers? And I'm like, because. <laughs> and uh, wh well, why, what's that thing on your head? Referring to my hearing aid. Oh, because. What are those cars? Because, because for me, it was just me. It was who I was. But they didn't get the chance to see that. And so I continued to draw and draw, and you can see me there looking very studious. And also, <laughs> There's a, there's a saxophone in the background, you guys, which I love. Um, it really, I mean, it's still pretty much me today, so. Um, and I had a lot of people really nurture me and nurture my talent and nurture my art, especially my parents and the adults around me. They recognize that. And living in a small town where you live with a rare syndrome and a not really diverse town, um, you're definitely standing out just for having eight fingers and being deaf. Like, it's kind of weird. And I always thought that, you know, having surgeries and going to the doctors every couple of weeks was normal. <laughs> it was just my life. <laughs> and so I really used art as an escape. I used it as escapism. 
And when I would get picked on, I would draw from my bullies to make sure they would leave me alone. Now we go, survival guys, you know. <laughs> and um, here is my version of the Mona Lisa I painted when I was six. Um, but it kind of looks like Jay Leno in drag. Uh, and I don't <laughs> really suggest you look that up on Dougal. I haven't, and I, I, I want to save you guys from that too. But once I was starting to get into high school, I started to realize, first of all, that I had this syndrome, and second of all, that I wasn't represented. You see, characters in media, especially with disabilities, have very specific tropes. So for example, a character with disabilities is often pitied, like Tiny Tim from A Christmas Carol, or a character goes through these really absurd events, and like a tall tale, and these are unattainable events, just like Forrest Gump. Or characters with disabilities are made to feel somebody with disability, without disabilities better about themselves, like Rain Man. And also characters with disabilities are villains, like Darth Vader or Captain Hook. And so these were the tropes and these were the things that I grew up with and I was never represented. And I remember, you know, getting into high school and really loving drawing and just falling in love with it. And I started recognizing that now not only children were kind of asking me questions, but adults were as well. And that kind of shocked me because you're taught to, te you know, to treat your elders well when you're a kid and you're like, you don't want to make your elders mad. Um, but I remember one specific event that taught me that was when I was 16 and I was in a pool and I was having a lot of fun with my friend. And we were just hanging out and this man came up to me and I did not know who he was. And I had my hearing aid off and he tried to talk to me and he's, I'm in the pool and he's kind of bigger than me, overlooking me. And he, he tried to ask me questions and then he realized I was deaf so he spoke up and he said, you know, I know a really good camp for people like you. I was like, what are you talking about? Like long haired people? <laughs> like, like, I was just like, I'm, I'm out here just enjoying my time with my friend. And he said, well, you're mentally retarded, right? And I paused for a second because you can't go tell an adult when you're 16 years old to go screw themselves, frankly. <laughs> and when that happens, it's intimidating. And especially when you have your hearing aid off and somebody's talking down to you like that, it already belittles you a lot. And so I said, you know, I said, man, this is what I have. I told him what I had. And I, and I said, I don't need that. And he looked at me and he rolled his eyes and he walked away. Because there's all these people that try to help me, but when they don't get, <laughs> when I say I don't need the help, they just, they don't even pay attention. And so I started recognizing these things and I started remembering that media wasn't representing me, I wasn't being represented. And so I thought that I could make work to be understood and so when I was about 17 years old, I was really going through a hard time and, and I was really trying to understand my syndrome and understand why I was having these surgeries. And I was asking these questions now and I was more interested in that. And I started making work about that. I started making work that reflected my feelings and reflected my sadness and my frustration with the people around me because I, 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 I wasn't understood. And toward the, toward the end of high school, and after I graduated high school and I was preparing to go to SCAD here in Atlanta, being in that par, and I told myself, I said, you know, for all those years that I was living in North Carolina, you know, I had to be very quiet. And I was like, no. Like, I have to change myself in order to survive. I had to be more vocal, I had to be more out front and in your face and jovial. And so I did. And while the two for the year and a half of college, I was still making this very dark 
work that I was frustrated with, but these were helping me heal. But I remember a professor telling me, she said, you know, I like what you're doing, but she said, I think it's time for you to make stuff that makes you happy. And I agreed. I was like, you know, at that time I was, in, I was finally in a space, an art school, where I was surrounded by people who were all different. And like, who accepted that? And I was like, oh my gosh, for the first time ever, I wasn't questioned about the way that I looked. For four years I was not, during that school period. And it was amazing. And so I started making work that made me happy. I started doing a lot of celebrity portraits. <laughs> and yeah, you know, and night and day, right? Rest in peace, Prince, you know. Um, and I started making work that made me happy. And in my senior year of college, I did my first um, art show over at Octane Westside, which was a series of celebrity portraits. It was about three years ago now. It's crazy, oh gosh. Um, and after college, after graduating college, I said, you know, I wanted to do freelancing, but I couldn't do it right away. So I worked a retail job. Yay. <laughs> um, <laughs> and we'll get, that, we'll get to that more in a moment. But um, when I was working this retail job, I was finishing a new show called Home is Where You Drown, and that was also at Octane Westside. And that's where a lot of people became really familiar with me was through this show where I shared stories like this one in the pool. This, this illustrates how I felt in the pool. Having, being gawked at, being stared at, and feeling judged. And when I was working retail and after I had that show out, I was starting to get some work, you know, like I was chugging alone and I was in retail. And I started recognizing that now adults are acting like children. Because Every week, when I was a cashier, I'd have someone try to touch my hearing aid without my permission. I'd have people ask me if I was in an accident because of my scars. And the thing that really put a light bulb in my head of what I needed to do to change these things was one day I was behind the cash register and this guy comes up to me and he says, you know, you, you should really go to an eye doctor because your eyes just look so crooked. And here's a friend of the boss that I work for. And I'm in a situation where I can't do anything or I'm gonna get fired. And so all I had to do was say, have a nice day. And I had to brush it aside. But a month later, he comes back in the store. And I avoid him, because I remember that face. But right before he leaves, he looks at me and he says, did you go to the eye doctor yet? A month later. And I said, no, I don't need to. And I went into the bathroom of the work and I cried. Because I was like, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of it. So eventually, luckily, I was able to get out of that job and start freelancing. And I was able to create a great body of work. Illustrations for Ted, MailChimp, murals for Octane, and great things in the last two years. I've been super thankful for that. But I recognized that people would either know me for my work or ask me about why I look so different. And I had those poor friend groups and all that. But it was like one or the other. And it was so weird, because I was still dealing with this stuff. And yet here I am having all these successes, and you would think that more people would recognize that than like, oh, why do you look so different? So I remember about a year ago going into a store and I was buying a lamp and I walk up to the cash register and you know, place my item down 
And then cashier goes, can you explain your disfigurement? And I was like, and I just blurted out, excuse me, like I was about to fight somebody. And I was like, I can't even barely fight anybody. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It was like when Blake was saying earlier about everyone being athletic here, I'm like, not me. <laughs> so she said, well, you know, you're disfigured. You look different. And I said, you know, just because I'm different from you doesn't mean I owe you an explanation for my difference. <laughs> and I said, you know, that was really rude. <laughs> and I'm trying to live my life just like you are. And she apologized. But that was, and that night I shared it on Facebook. And I started getting these comments. And they were saying, I can't believe that this happens. And I say, that's exactly the problem. Is <laughs> because when we say we can't believe something, we disassociate ourselves from those situations. And maybe it's because we might have said things like that to other people before. And, and, but we need to dig inside ourselves and recognize that these things happen. Because I can't complain if I don't do something about it. We all hate those people, usually. Yes, right? <laughs> um, and so I kept sharing these stories and on Facebook. And I'm sure we have that one Facebook friend that always posts so much social activism-based things, and yet they're not doing anything about it. And so I was like, OK, I'm, I'm going to do something. <laughs> and I had. A show in 2015, my third show at Octane, where I collaborated with really wonderful people like Yo-Yo Farrow and Black Cat Tips and Cat Lana. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and um, people were like, oh, what's next? And I was like, I'm taking a year off. I'm not doing a show. I'm not doing a show in 2016. And I remember being in this weird part where I was like, I don't know what I want to do next. I was like, maybe I want to, maybe I want to do more activist things. Maybe I want to be more of an activist. And you know, I looked into social work and like going back into school and doing all this stuff. And I'm like, uh, I, I don't really want to. And then I remembered when I was a teenager, and I remembered when I felt the need for representation. And I felt the need to express myself, my true inner self, and not the dogs in outer space, and not the prince paintings. And they're great, and I will always do that. And I will always be painting weird shit, and I love him. <laughs> but as artists and creatives, we're messengers. We have a really great power in that. And I think that's something that we need to remember. And as messengers, we need to tell stories. We need to tell stories differently, not just doing the same thing over and over and over again. And so I start drawing these things, and, I, and I'm painting, and I'm drawing, and I'm like, oh, you know, like, maybe I'll do this and that and the other. And I'm like, no, 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 this is, this is not what it is. I said, I'm just going to go take some photos. I'm going to go and film stuff. And I'm going to go do sound installation and, and do different things. And so I started a project called How Nice. And this is a self-portrait called Another Day. And it talks about how when people come up to me and they hear that I've had all these surgeries, they say, oh, you must have been through so much. And I'm like, yes, I did it. But I had nine surgeries by age one. I don't remember age one. When we go through adversity, you, you have the life that you have. You shouldn't pity that. You should respect it. And don't question it. And this show is about sharing these experiences and, and meshing my survival of 
my art making and meshing my survival of activism and putting it together to create something new to hopefully give others, you know, a, a sense of just understanding and to give different perspective to disability and to give different perspective in general. So, and this show is actually gonna be out next month on July 29th at Murmur. And so please do come out to that. Um, this is the only photo people will ever see. There's, you're not gonna see anything else unless you go to the show. <laughs> I'm gonna be tight, I've been tight-lipped for like a year and a half on it and it's been like, oh my gosh. You see, for me, survival is speaking my truth in a world that doesn't take the time to understand my truth. And I think we all had to recognize in this building is that the people next to you and the people beside you and the people behind you and the people in front of you are all surviving. And so when you see somebody that looks different from you and then they raise your eyebrow, put your eyebrow down. <laughs> and get to know them for them because you don't know what they have behind them. Because sharing somebody's story is a privilege and it's not a right. Nobody owes you a story. Nobody owes you anything. You owe yourself stuff, but nobody else owes you anything. So survival for me is speaking my truth in a world that doesn't take the time to understand it. Thank you.